X Talks connects professionals in the life science, medical device, and food industries with useful content like webinars, job openings, articles, and virtual meetings to help you succeed in your career. This food industry focused podcast brings together some of our editorial staff to share insights into the latest B2B industry news to help keep you up to date. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the X Talks Food Podcast. I'm Sydney Perlmutter, Senior Food Industry Journalist and Webinar Moderator at xtalks.com, and this week I'm joined by Vera Kovacevic. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I'm going to start us off with a story about um, micro and macro plastics, and these are sort of a growing concern within the food industry. If you haven't heard of them before, they're tiny particles, primarily from environmental contamination, and they can infiltrate the food supply. And obviously, understanding their presence and potential impacts is crucial for industry stakeholders. So of course, plastics are ubiquitous in consumer and industrial products ranging from packaging to automotive parts. And most plastics, um, unable to biodegrade, break down over time into microplastics, less than five millimeters in length, and nanoplastics, which are less than one micron in length. And these particles can be found in various shapes, sizes, and colors, complicating their identification and assessment. Micro uh, plastics and nanoplastics primarily contaminate food through environmental exposure, or crops and livestock are raised. And despite concerns, current evidence does not show significant migration of these particles from plastic food packaging into foods and beverages. And nonetheless, consumers may still be exposed through air, food, and skin contact from personal care products. Now, I was actually kind of surprised that, um, you know, I, I feel like we hear a lot about like, oh, don't heat plastic, um, especially like plastic water bottles, because you could be ingesting some of that. Like, were you surprised that, and this is coming from the FDA, so you, were you surprised that like um, no evidence shows significant migration of these particles from food p packaging into foods and beverages? Um, well, you know, technically, to be honest, no, I'm not surprised because I wasn't really expecting that because the plastic that it's packaged in is usually very durable. Um, it's usually, you know, um, stored under normal temperature conditions. It's not left out in the sun or anything and usually transported really safely and um, kept in a good condition. So I'm not really expecting them to find anything or detect anything that way. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a that that's true. I guess I never thought of it that way. What about I mean, what is the the fear then with like you know reheating plastic um, packaging or, or or water bottles? Let's say like, is there legitimacy to that fear? Um, I wouldn't know because I haven't really looked into like how much and what what kind of plastic degrades under what temperature, mm -hmm. right? And I think there's different plastics and and some are suitable for like, for example, oven use or microwave use, right? So that should be fine. Others are probably not. But I personally have always like, I, I don't like, you know, storing things in, in heat and plastic. I, it's not something I, I like, I would want to do. And whenever I cook something, I never cook it in plastic. Even if I'm buying like, you know, those ready to like instant soups mm -hmm. where they come in that plastic container and they tell you let's just pour hot water in there and I'm like no 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 it's okay I'll do it in my <laughs> you know metal pot right <laughs> you know it's just something that um is engraved in me to do although I, I do trust them that it's safe however just the idea of like heat or sunlight exposing plastic to me that's something I try to avoid mm -hmm. So are you using glass containers? Yes. Yeah. Yes, those are great. Um, so in terms of like the regulatory and health perspectives, the FDA monitors research on nano and microplastics in foods, and the agency states that the mere presence of these particles doesn't necessarily indicate a health risk. And there's also no current evidence to suggest that levels found in foods, such as seafood, salt, and bottled water, pose a danger to human health. However, without standardized methods for detecting and quantifying microplastics, assessing their true impact remains a bit of a challenge for them. But the FDA, alongside the U.S. Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, is investigating the health effects of these particles. And although some studies indicate potential risks, 
um, or health impacts, conclusive evidence is still lacking. So the FDA is going to take regulatory action if future research demonstrates a health risk uh, from nanoplastics and microplastics in foods. And then in terms of like the industry implications for food industry stakeholders, they obviously have to stay informed about the evolving science and regulations around microplastics and nanoplastics. So companies have to ensure compliance with the FDA regulations for food contact materials, which mandate safety evaluations to prevent harmful migration to food. So I talked about this before. The bottled water, for instance, has shown microplastic contamination, yet current levels don't breach FDA. FDA safety standards. However, um, bottled water producers obviously have to adhere to FDA regulations to avoid their products being deemed adulterated or misbranded. So, um, this all all of this info is coming from a new web page about nanoplastic and microplastics um, in food from the FDA's website. So, if you want to learn more, you can definitely check out that web page. But um, I feel like yeah, we've been hearing about micro and macro plastics for a really long time in food. Um, and I got to say, I mean, while I'm happy about, you know, that there aren't any, that there's no current evidence to suggest any potential, like, risk to human health right now, but anticlimactic of a report from the FDA. I guess they just want to reassure people not to be worried. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think so. I think um, kind of like what you asked me earlier, your first question was kind of relating to the source of plastics being from food packaging, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But then there's also the source of plastic coming from the environment into right. animals. Yes. Right? Which Especially is fish. Yeah, like you can't really take that plastic out of the fish. No. I don't think there's any way. They haven't developed any way to remove that. But definitely plastics in the environment are a big concern and they do end up in in um, the food chain. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that is a, I think like a very big um, issue. There's lots of studies being done like environmental scientists trying to understand like what are the toxic impacts of those micro and nanoplastics on like aquatic species but i'm sure there's also studies being done to see like okay are these plastics microplastics nanoplastics in animals such as fish then being ingested by humans going into humans right right so i can't really say like what is the bigger concern is it from food packaging or is it from um you know, uh, environmental Mm -hmm. pollution or contamination? If I had to guess, I would think the former, just because it feels so much less preventable. Like, there's only so much you can do now if... Because, I mean, food companies can kind of... Everything can be overhauled and changed, but I just think it would take a lot more time to um, remove all, like, plastic waste from the ocean than it would for companies to change how they package their foods yeah (laughs) but yeah I'd also be curious to know which is the which is the bigger like danger which is more prevalent um and I'd be interested also to know about like you know current levels of microplastic in in us and like in our bloodstream or however it gets into us or stays inside of us and how that would have differed from 100 or 200 years ago when plastic like wasn't as prevalent in our food system because it would probably be vastly different yeah and there were worse things 200 years ago than there are now but true you know like it's it's all it's all relative but um i obviously understand why plastic is used so much within the food industry it's 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 cheap it's easy it can some of it sometimes it can be recycled um and Yeah, I wonder, I also wonder sort of how um, this speaks on the effectiveness of of, of recycling. Like, if everyone all recycled properly, this shouldn't technically be an issue. What do you mean? Which issue? Uh, Of microplastics, right? Of of plastic waste and it breaking down into microplastics. Like, if everyone actually, and not just people, but if if recycling um, plants did what they were supposed to do and if people all recycled and disposed of their trash how they are supposed to then maybe this wouldn't be as big of an issue but I don't know I'm kind of speculating that's what I mean oh you're talking about like if plastic didn't end up in the environment right exactly in the first place exactly yeah 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 Yeah, then I think the only focus would be on plastics from food packaging Mm -hmm. right that would be the only main research being done Mm -hmm. um but regarding like what you said I was kind of surprised about how nanoplastics are detected in water bottles Mm. i actually never heard of this i've 
can you was that was that on the FDA's website? Can you give yes. a little bit more information? So there is nanoplastics and microplastics detected, but they're under a threat like a certain level. Do you yes. know? Could you be able to like tell us what is that level? I'm just curious. Oh, that is a good that is a good question. Um, so I'm just on the FDA's website right now, um, and it's you're kind of saying what what you were saying. Plastic range. Plastics range widely in terms of their characteristics and applications. Thanks, Sydney, because I'm just thinking, like, isn't any level of uh, microplastics in drinking water a concern? I'm just like, okay, maybe if it's small enough or the density of it is low enough, it's not a concern. <laughs> so it's saying, while many studies have reported the presence of microplastics in several foods, including salt, seafood, sugar, beer, bottled water, also honey, milk, and T, current scientific evidence does not demonstrate that the levels of microplastics or nanoplastics detected in foods pose a risk to human health. Um, okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's what they've got. That's what they've got. And there yeah. is, they don't, they're not publicly talking about the, th the, the amount or the, th the threshold, I guess, because they don't see it as being. It's variable to probably. They, yeah. And they don't, yeah, and they don't see it as being enough of an issue, I guess. Um, but I am glad that you know they're they're monitoring this, um, because I guess in the realm of things, using plastics so widely in the food industry is kind of is kind of a new. If we're talking in the, the last like century, it's kind of a new thing. Like glass was the dominant. Um, glass, yeah. yeah, glass was dominant, especially in beverages, right? It, you know, milk, water soda and now it's like mostly plastic or sometimes paper but um or aluminum or whatever it is um so yeah i, I it's it's good that, that the fda is is monitoring this and maybe maybe it, we just need more time to know i mean plastic has been around for a decent amount of time in food but maybe not long enough um for us to for us to know um but i'm relieved i'm relieved that it's not yeah. it's not a danger yeah yet, yet. Well, you know, if it was, it would have shown up by now. Like yeah. you said, it was used for a long time. And I think that their like, an methods of analysis are very, really sophisticated today, mm -hmm. both in terms of like detecting the plastic and then also like quantifying what it affects, mm -hmm. right? So if they're saying they're monitoring it and it's not a health concern, then, mm -hmm. then that's, that's good news, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and we always, you know, it's, it's we want to be always um, – not necessarily scrutinizing, but just being cu curious, like have curiosity about what the FDA is saying, but also have a certain level of trust in the FDA. Like these are, you know, we have to trust the FDA, otherwise there will be chaos. So. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, you trust the scientists. Right? Yes, yes, we got to trust the science. So um, hopefully they won't steer us wrong. I mean, they want to see humanity continue. So. <laughs> All right, so moving on to our next story. Um, in a similar vein, actually, um, track and trace platforms, which I'll sort of explain a little bit more in detail, these are essential in the food and beverage industry to ensure safety, um, transparency, and efficiency. And these are systems that are designed to monitor the journey of products from origin to consumption. And they enhance the ability to trace the history, location, and application of items, which is vital for quality control and regulatory compliance. So what are they? So these are... Um, um, track and trace platforms in the food industry are digital systems that log detailed information about every stage of a product's life cycle. So this includes data from initial production phases through processing and distribution to the final point of sale. And these platforms use technologies like barcodes, radio frequency identification or RFID tags, and um, blockchains to collect and store data. And they allow companies to monitor and manage their supply chains effectively. So these systems provide real-time updates which help businesses quickly identify and address issues so for instance if a contamination is detected uh, the platform can pinpoint the affected batches and locations enabling swift recalls and this level of traceability not only helps in managing risks but also builds consumer trust so yeah kind of similar to you know the the last story we were talking about like these these systems are really in place to um identify exactly where something could have gone wrong, um, you know, in the very vast food supply chain. Um, and just thinking to 
even 50 years ago like we didn't have anything nearly as you know complex as this um and maybe it's due to um the globalization more of the food system um as opposed to maybe everything was a bit more local um decades ago and centuries ago so these things are really needed and not only are they needed but they're um you know they they they're they're mandated sometimes um because agencies like the FDA and the USDA are holding companies they have to be held accountable right um and they have to be able to you know swiftly um announce recalls when they happen so yeah these these are are really essential platforms um so had you ever heard of the term track and trace before food or otherwise um when you said that i was thinking about like online ordering mm, yeah like, yes um, tracking like where in the world your shipment is yes yeah not only where in the world but like okay uh order received yes uh preparing for shipment yeah order sent out yeah or order at this facility order yeah. at that facility <laughs> does it need to cross customs right. is it in customs okay like you know there's so many different steps in the mm -hmm. shipping process and that's what i thought of and I thought, okay, so they do this through scanning barcodes. Mm -hmm. But then you also mentioned two other methods that I'm not too familiar how they work. You mentioned blockchain, which I don't know how that works or what that really is. And then you mentioned some radio frequency. RFID tags. It, that's not the same as a barcode? It's very similar. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and blockchain, they're all kind of similar. I mean, they're all using like scanning technology um, okay. which is then like data that's stored and collected, right? Um, so, okay. so yeah. They're scanning either a barcode or like another, like a yeah, QR code. Yeah, or a tag. Code, or, or, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So they all scan something mm -hmm. that's on the product. Mm -hmm. So what about um, perhaps in the food industry, before mm -hmm. an item or a food item is packaged, mm -hmm. right? How is it traced before? for that part like in the actual facility do you think like the, the they have like a lot like this bin has a specific code mm. probably that's how they do it right that's like a, if the food hasn't been packaged yet that's a very yet. good question I, I i'm wondering if if that's part of of you know the manufacturing process if that's part of they must have some kind it of it must it must be yeah. um because I'm thinking in terms of just like quality control, mm -hmm. yeah, they have to be able to to track everything. And yeah. I guess you're talking more in terms of like um, manufactured goods, not like produce and and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's a that's a good point. They like must they, have a system like oh, this bin, this date, this time, it was here. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure. Yeah, like I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm sure Probably they do. Probably same same idea with yeah. codes and scanners. And yeah, everything. yeah. I mean, because I don't. Yeah, obviously, you know, if we're, we're eating a chip, each individual chip isn't yeah, going to have true. a chip in it <laughs> <laughs> or, like, something yeah. to scan on yeah. it. So you're right. It's probably, like, binned or sectioned off, um, and they're able to scan and keep track of it. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, and to that point, I mean, yeah, why do food and beverage companies use these things? So they, they have to implement track and trace platforms for a number of reasons. And one of the primary reasons, of course, is regulatory compliance. So like I was saying, like governments and international um, bodies require stringent tracking of food products to ensure public um, health and safety. So by using these com platforms, companies can easily adhere to these regulations. And another significant benefit is improved quality control and assurance. So obviously with this detailed, this level of detailed tracking, businesses can ensure that their products meet the required standards at every stage of the supply chain. And this minimizes the risk, um, this minimizes the risk of defects or contamination reaching the consumer. And they're also used to enhance transparency, which is increasingly demanded by customers. So a lot of customers today want to know where their food comes from, how it's processed, and if it meets safety standards. So providing this information can boost brand loyalty and trust. Because, um, yeah, this isn't just for, um, you know, food safety and, and compliance, which is, I mean, it's, it, it's mainly for that. But also now customers kind of want to know where things are coming from so they can make you know, informed decisions about the foods they're buying. Um, and because sometimes cus customers may not want to purchase products that they think may have been produced unethically or in a place that they, they don't trust. So, I, I mean, me personally, I'm, I'm not 
I don't have time to scrutinize so much <laughs> when I'm at the grocery store. I just kind of need food, and I kind of already know what I want. Um, but I respect, I, you know, and, and I respect it. I respect people wanting to make more informed decisions. Um, and then lastly, these platforms are used to op offer operational efficiencies. So this automated data collection reduces the need for manual record, record keeping, um, which obviously saves time and, and, and reduces human error. So they enable better inventory management by providing real-time data on stock levels and product locations, which can help optimize supply chains and of course reduce food waste as well. So it's, it's a very comprehensive, like these platforms are extremely comprehensive. You know what I was just thinking about when you mentioned like people want to know where their food came from? Um, I think it is a legal requirement that the company has to put like a made in a certain country mm -hmm. for that food item, right? But then I always wondered like, is the whole thing really sourced and made in that country? Did they input import like materials or ingredients from other countries? Like, did you ever wonder that? And I'm like, is this entire thing, like, I don't know, made in Spain? Mm, that's a really good question. I'm sure it's like they they choose their words very carefully because um, I don't know if I see, like, you always see, like, made in a certain country with, with clothing or certain other items, but with food? We do, though, right? With food, too. Pro Maybe like, they say produced or manufactured in a certain country. Is it just me? Do, don't no, they have, no. like, the country name? No, I think you're right the about that. the international section of grocery, grocery stores. Yes. For sure they will mm -hmm. say where it came from. Or import, yeah, or like where it's been imported from or yes. something. Yeah. Made in this country, imported yeah. by, and then yeah. they have whatever, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Account. So you're wondering like what was, did all parts of the production process take place in that specific country? Yes. I guess there's a certain like <laughs> rules that they have to follow. Yeah like um for it in order to have that made in but that's the only thing that i think consumers notice i don't think they th go on beyond well sometimes they want to know was this made in like a cruelty free mm -hmm. or or were they the animals raised in a certain way but i think those are all like um like extra things you know what i mean mm -hmm. like oh how were the animals raised what did they eat mm -hmm. those are all optional but i think the made in is mandatory right I, th I think so that's a really good question um I don't know if it's mandatory for like for all products I definitely know that I see it on um produce packaging like okay. you know pr um, grown in wherever yes. um and yeah. you know it gets here somehow whether it was you know whether they're in somewhere in Ontario or somewhere across the world like mm -hmm. usually with produce we see it I'd have to take a better look at like um CPG goods like pr like manufactured goods for food because yeah. I don't know if if all of them say it it might yeah. just be an optional thing yeah yeah uh, and, and then I was just thinking of furniture like sometimes it just says assembled in oh yeah yeah <laughs> right because because yeah, yeah because there are so many like parts of the the food supply chain like yeah, I, I kind of am questioning whether if something says made in or produced in Yeah, blank. did you ever wonder, was it all from that country, everything? <laughs> uh, but anyways, that's just something I wonder <laughs> on the topic of uh, track and traceability. Track and tra well, yeah. you know, with these track and trace platforms, you could probably get those answers. If they make this data available to consumers, which I think is optional, like I don't mm -hmm. think they have to make, um, you know, codes for, for, for people to scan to to track and trace themselves um but it's becoming more demanded um by some people especially with things like um with coffee i feel like people always want to know like oh where's this coffee where where are the beans sourced from who um you know were they working in ethical conditions like yes. things like that um yeah with with foods that have the potential i think for higher like you know unethical production methods mm -hmm. I think those are the sort of things where where, where more people are curious about yeah. yeah where these things came from but yeah that's a good question I'll have to look into whether it's it's necessary or whether they have to say it was made in in this place but um I know with with things like for example with with things that come from a certain region I'm thinking like you know maple syrup Canada it's a very Canadian thing um you'll always see on it like made in Canada yeah. or, or, or whatever. Um, and I'm wondering, 
Or like Parmesan, like Parmigiano Reggiano, like the actual Parmesan cheese, like from that region in Italy. Um, mm. it, it it literally says it on the on the rind of the cheese. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe maybe it's it's for um, specific food foods that are maybe more prone to like food fraud, where they where they have to say it, or because if you're not, because for example, like I think any food item that was imported mm -hmm. you have to say what country it was made in right but if it was made in canada or like came from a local farm maybe mm -hmm. not may not be necessary yeah yeah so so many rules <laughs> may not be necessary if they're selling it to the right citizens of that country right exactly um so anyway um all great all great thoughts all great questions um and i just want to sort of talk about some um prominent track and trace platforms that that are around and one of them is um, the IBM Food Trust and this is a blockchain based platform that enhances transparency and efficiency in the supply chain and it allows users to trace the journey of food products from farm to table securely so this is one where consumers um, can actually look into it um, um, another one is called SAP Global Track and Trace, and it offers comprehensive visibility and traceability across the supply chains, integrating existing, existing systems to provide real-time data and analytics. Another one is called Food Logic Lodge IQ Connect, and it's um, it enables companies to manage supplier relationships, track incidents, and comply with regulatory requirements. Another one is RFXL, um, which provides robust track and trace solutions with a focus on compliance and data integrity. And then the last one is uh, called Trace One, which specializes in product lifecycle management and traceability by connecting retailers, manufacturers, and suppliers to ensure uh, product safety and quality. So um, the, the four latter ones that I mentioned, um, I believe they're mostly for um, manufacturers themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but then the IBM Food Trust is, is more geared towards consumers and allowing them yeah. to... I mean, I, I think it's also for manufacturers, like it's, but they, they give access, um, you know, to consumers to be able to, to track things. Yeah, that yeah. was the one that stood out to me mm -hmm. too. It was, it was the only B2C one, mm -hmm. which I thought was really neat. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've seen, I've seen it being used before. Um, you, you go onto their website, you, tr you, you punch in a code um, for that specific item. Um, and I remember it was specifically being for foods, like I was mentioning, with potential for high food fraud. And the example that I saw it being done on was like olive oil. Um, oh. Yeah. So I, I think that these are like, it's important for all food, but yeah, f food specifically that is prone to food fraud. Um, yeah, like olive oil, Parmesan, maple syrup. I think that's where these systems are like really being used Honey. for. Honey. Yeah. There's so many. Um, wine. W yeah, wine, like luxury goods, like yeah. caviar, um, et cetera. Really <laughs> or, the, or the foods that um, were unfortunately could be made in, you know, unethical working mm -hmm. conditions. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. What's the name of that uh, company, that IBM? The IBM Food Trust. IBM, like the software company. Oh, that it's, we... it's them. Mm -hmm. Their division. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Really cool. And I, I, I mean, it makes total sense to me as a consumer why you'd want to be able to trace things like that because you're usually paying a premium for them and you want to ensure that you're, that the premium is not going to waste. Like you're, you're yeah. not paying for a fake food. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And then also in terms of safety, like you want to ensure like this, this was produced safely and, and, and sort of you know pass all the tests or whatever but it, it makes total sense to me like now that I'm that I'm really analyzing it and thinking about it and so when you saw it applied for olive oil what did it look like was it just like a one page like uh, origin location of origin yeah. how specific how detailed was it I, I can't really remember um okay. yeah sorry I can't really remember what it looked like but I believe it kind of yeah, like you were saying, you know, at the beginning, like when, when you're talking about like tracking a delivery item, I think it right. was similar to that. Like where, okay. although more detailed than that. Yeah, like yeah. With, you know, where where the olives were sourced from. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah, I think it, it goes into a lot of detail. Um, and like I said, I, I'm not too 
I don't really need to know. I'm not terribly curious. But if I was spending a lot of money on, on an item, yeah, like wine especially too. People are very like, oh, you know, where did this come from? Yeah. Like people are very like the into wine their yard, wine. Where is it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. People are very into into their wines and, and you know, other foods as well. So I, I think these are these are great, not just yeah, not just for safety and compliance, but like for customers, for consumers who wanna know like, yeah, where where these things come from if you got the time true <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right well that's the end of this episode of the x talks food podcast if you like today's show don't forget to rate review and subscribe thanks everyone and see you next week bye bye thanks for listening to the x talks food industry podcast if you enjoyed our discussions today please share the episode with your friends and colleagues and be sure to subscribe in order to be notified when a new episode is released to join in on the discussion, you can find Xtalks on social media, email podcast at xtalks.com, or comment on the articles directly. Links are in the show description. Take a moment to join our community at xtalks.com to get access to everything we have to offer, including webinars, job listings, virtual meetings, articles, and more. The views and opinions expressed in the podcast are those of the speakers sharing them. They should not be taken as professional advice and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position Honeycomb Worldwide. For further information, email us at podcast at xtalks.com. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week.